Good morning, everyone. My name is Luke Tannen, and I'm the Executive Director of Chicago Innovation, an organization that educates, connects, and celebrates local innovative companies coming across all industries, big and small, for-profits and nonprofits, through a series of events and programs. And we are also here today because uh, we are a very proud partner and customer of Wintrust. And on behalf of Wintrust, I'd like to welcome you all to today's virtual event, Fraud Prevention, Integrated Payables, and the Future of Banking. We have some great experts from Wintrust today who will be bringing this topic to life. First up will be Ezra Jaffe. Ezra has been in banking in Chicago for 30 years, including 10 years at Wintrust. He has treasury management sales at Wintrust covering the full footprint and all lines of business. He's a frequent speaker on the state of banking fraud and digital banking. Then following Ezra will be Michelle Westerhoff, who began her banking career in 1999 and has a background in deposit operations, accounting, finance, treasury management support, and also sales. Today, she's Vice President of Treasury Sales, supporting sales efforts across multiple Wintrust charters and lines of business. And taking us home will be Jamie Voss. Jamie joined Wintrust in 2014 as Vice President of Treasury Management Sales. She has over 25 years of banking experience in client servicing, business banking, treasury management, and AP automation. Jamie also speaks to groups about industry trends, AP automation, fraud, and changing regulations. Together, this group will take you through payment fraud trends, what this means for your business, share some best practices that can help you now, and give a glimpse into the future of banking. Now, before we meet them, I'd like to let everyone here know that if you have a question during the presentation, you can send it to us via the Zoom chat while the event is taking place so our speakers can see what is on your mind and they can try to respond to it. Also, keep an eye out for a few polling questions so we can learn more about you, the audience. And now I'd like to hand the Zoom mic over to Ezra Jaffe, Group Senior Vice President and Head of Treasury Management Sales at Wintrust, who will be kicking off today's presentation. Morning, Luke, how are you doing today? Um, I'm doing much better now that you're speaking, Ezra. <laughs> That's a snazzy picture you got behind you. Was there a story by that picture? You know what, I'm, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a painting of a, of a table and some flowers. Very exciting, very exciting. Luke, thanks, thanks for having us this morning. So what I'm gonna try to do right now through the power of technology is I'm gonna share my screen um, so I can put the presentation uh, uh, up for everyone to see. And uh, we should be going in that direction. So that's good. And we'll start the presentation um, from the beginning. That's good. How's that going? Is that what, can everybody look and you see that uh, first slide? Looks perfect. Excellent. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're uh, happy to be presenting to you this morning on uh, um, uh, fraud, the future of banking and integrated payables. As, as uh, Luke said, I'm Ezra Jaffe. I'd like to share something personal about myself and that is I am a, a, a very major Cleveland loyal sports fan, longtime uh, Cleveland sports fan. I say that to you one, so you know that you know I'm in a little bit of a bad mood coming off of Sunday, um, but also to proof of my loyalty and long-term thinking. And hopefully those kind of trends are worked here into this presentation. Um, I'm also a, a um, you know, I, I hate business buzzwords. I don't know about the rest of you, but they make, they make me crazy. So I encourage everyone, if you have a refrigerator nearby your computer, to play along with me with this little um, Zoom drinking game. And every time, these are the six phrases, anytime any of these six buzz phrases are uttered by me or Michelle or Jamie during this presentation, please feel free to take a drink. And so those phrases that pay today are pivot, disruptors, ubiquitous, digital transformation, unicorn, and my personal, the one I hate the most is the fraudster. To me, the fraudster is this happy-go-lucky, you know, person picking pockets here and there. Um, the fraudster is the thief, and I will do my best to refer to them as thieves throughout this presentation and try to avoid other business uh, buzzwords. Um, on this next slide here are just uh, a couple pictures, just reminders really to me of, of, of some frauds that I've seen personally that I wanna share with you guys. Um, the first picture is Al Franken. Now, I don't know Al Franken, but my neighbor, um, um, uh, Al, uh, coincidentally, uh, looks very similar to him. And he has his head of four, he's a physician, has 401k, and um, it's managed by a private investment firm. And one day the investment firm gets an email from Alan saying he wants to make a $100,000 withdrawal from his 401k to buy uh, an apartment in London uh, and, uh, and he has laryngitis, so please don't call him. Please only use email. Now, right, as I'm saying these things, I can see Jamie, the only person I can see on my screen right now, 
smiling as I tell that story because like it's ridiculous that story. But of course, the firm wired money is uh, for wired money out of his four hundred one k over to London for the funds never to be seen again. And when you think about it, that was a four hundred one k. So there were tax penalties that were incurred for early withdrawal from the four hundred one k. Utterly ridiculous. Um, this Corvette here. That's the kind of, if I got to get a Corvette, that's the kind that I would want, um, the Stingray. Um, um, we had a customer who um, was getting monthly ACHs out of their, taken out of their account and they didn't reconcile their account regularly. And one day they looked and they said, what is this ACH? And they, they called up the bank and we did research on it and it's someone else's car payment. Random person, not even an employee, random person who, when they put in their account information for auto debit, used a random company's information. And so they, they were paying for six months um, his Corvette payments. Um, the, the calculator on the left reminds me of an accounting firm, um, a decent sized accounting firm uh, in the Chicagoland area. And one day the uh, CFO got, got an email from the uh, managing partner saying they were making an acquisition, please wire money. Um, and the CFO didn't want it, you know, bother him or anything. And so he, without calling to confirm, wired the money. Of course, it was a fake email. The money was gone. Um, and on the last one, um, the wires um, had a customer, um, you know, the, the classic changing supplier information. You know, we changed banks. Uh, so please, from now on, wire the money to this new location. Fraud is, fraud is rampant right now. Um, and, and you really, really have to be on the guard, on guard. In addition to being a frequent speaker on fraud, this is one of my credentials. Uh, oh, 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 like coming in and out there. Hard to see. Okay, let's try this one more time. This is one of my, I won't show up. Uh, this is a bill that I have personally from the a Small Business Administration for $44,300 um, for a loan that apparently Jaffe Livestocks took out about uh, uh, four months ago, part of the SBA disaster recovery, not a PPP loan, the disaster recovery loans. And um, they sent me a bill. Um, I've done a little research on it, and the SBA. Again, not the PPP, the EDIL, I think it's called, program has been rampant. The estimates between 10 and three to $10 billion in fraud from the program because they did not have sufficient controls going on. And, um, and someone made off with this forgivable $44,300. I filed with the uh, FBI and the SBA and the US Invest, uh, Investigator General. I missed the term a little wrong, but. Um, so that's one of my other uh, credentials in speaking today. Okay, so speaking of fraud, we now come to poll question number one. So can we pop poll question number one up on the screen here? Coming up, just to make sure that everybody's awake, paying attention and not uh, um, checking the sports scores from last night. Um, there we go. In the past 12 months, which have you or your company experienced? So you can check multiple ones that apply on this. So please, uh, um, check to see what you've experienced. And we'll get some poll results going to see what happened. Uh, personally, I checked uh, the SBA, uh, also a victim of uh, unemployment fraud. I'm very curious to see how many people are that. Illinois situation is horrible. Um, when I speak, uh, it seems like 30% of the crowd are, are um, victims of unemployment fraud. And then I get calls from people afterwards like, what did you do again during that unemployment fraud? How did you handle it? And then the call came from my boss who called me with the same question. He said, I heard you're of unemployment fraud. What, what, what happened to you on that? I'm just vamping here as we got the results posted on the screen. Again, as was mentioned before, oh, here we go. 46%, holy cannoli. Wow. I think that's massively being unreported in the news, how bad that's going on. Credit card fraud, a good old fashioned standby. Um, that's going on there. Email, business email, compromise, check fraud. Yeah, good to see the ACH fraud low in this group, though we'll talk later. It's up on the rise. Oh, I'm not alone in my SBA fraud, so that's good. Okay, great. Terrific. Um, I'm using, by the way, for now when I speak, I'm using that 46%. Um, okay, so now I'm going to pass this off to uh, Michelle Westeroff um, to get into some information on um, more specifically on fraud. So Michelle, um, oh, sorry, that was me pressing the wrong thing. Okay, Michelle, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Ezra. Um, thank you for that uh, enthusiastic kickoff to our event here. And I must say really quick that 
I, I can only aspire to be that person who has six months worth of a Corvette payment coming out of my account and that's gonna go unrecognized. So um, I, I can only hope that one day that, that could quite possibly be me. However, definitely uh, negative um, repercussions of that as well. But I, I don't think one month of that payment would go unnoticed for me. So just saying. Um, so thank you again. My name is Michelle Westerhoff. I'm a vice president in treasury sales for Wintrust. Um, I will be celebrating my 10 year Wintrust anniversary in April of uh, this year. So I'm very excited about that. I'm very fortunate to be at Wintrust, especially in this environment. I'm fortunate to work with um, amongst great coworkers and supportive management here. Um, one personal note that I will add over the last uh, year or so, I would say, um, I've become quite the avid Netflix watcher, um, Netflix enthusiast, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, so if you have any uh, questions, recommendations on a, a good Netflix series, go ahead and, and throw it into the chat and uh, we'll see if, uh, see if I can uh, make any recommendations to get you through this uh, winter with the pandemic uh, we've got on our hands here. So, um, okay, so to get us started here this morning, um, the AFP puts together a, an annual um, polling, surveying of clients just like yourselves, organizations of all uh, sizes, um, and the data that we're going to present, we'll start out with just some basic statistics this morning, and this is all based on 2019 data, and this slide in particular this shows the percentage of organizations that have experienced, attempted, and or actual payment fraud over a 10-year period. And what I, I find very interesting about this slide is between 2009 and 2013, there is actually a decline in fraud attempts and actual fraud, and then it plateaued in 2013, 2014, only, <clears throat> excuse me, only to have a large uptick in 2015, and now we're all the way up to 81% of organizations reporting that they have been victims or attempted victims of payment fraud in 2019. Um, so that tells me this is on the rise for a reason and fraudsters have been successful. So next slide, please. Okay. so. Payment methods that were the targets of attempted or actual payment fraud. And this comes as no surprise to anyone here that 74% of our fraud is still being perpetrated through paper checks. Um, paper checks are still the most common B2B payment method used today. Um, what I do find at least encouraging, although wire transfers still come in high at 40% of fraud, uh, that is actually a decline of 5% over 2018. So that's some good news. We'll certainly take it. Thankfully, it seems like the internal control and security procedures that clients and banks have been working so hard to implement is working in that area. Okay, next. Okay, so the sources of attempted fraud and payment fraud how are they actually doing it, you ask? And that is a great, great question. Well, 61% of the fraud that has originated now is being done through BEC, or business email compromise. In a BEC scam, criminals send out an email. It appears to be from a known source. They provide updated payment instructions, which of course it turns out to be a fraudulent account. We have had situations here at the bank where clients have been remitting two to three payments that they thought were going to their vendor, only to, only to be notified maybe 45, 60 days into their payment cycle that these payments in fact had not been received by their vendor and their account is past due. So when they look into that further, unfortunately the source in the most cases is through a BEC scam. And so as you can imagine, when that extended time frame has already taken place, 45, 60 days, and those payments have already been remitted, those funds are, are likely unrecoverable at that point. Okay. So for outside individual and third party, yeah, I, I would think of it this way. Anytime you write a paper check, 
how many hands uh, does that paper check and envelope go through? So in, at any point during that process, there can be a breach, okay? So on the next slide here, I think we got a little bit jumbled up. Uh, Ezra and I have to work on our, our ESP skills for uh, advancing our slides to these presentations. Normally these are done in person if you haven't guessed that uh, already. Um, but uh, but I, I always like to share, you know, we're all bankers, uh, business um, owners and so on. I like to see things in dollar figures and that's very impactful to me. And I think when we look at uh, the loss and can quantify that in a, a total dollar figure um, for the BEC scams, it, it, it is really very stag staggering and it's a good reminder to remain vigilant, okay? So next slide, please. Okay, best practices and bank tools. So what do I do? Okay, to begin talking about best practices, we'll also touch on what some of companies are lacking. And on this uh, next slide here, you'll see some fun visuals. And what these visuals really represent is a lack of internal control, lack of separation of duties, dual control, lack of visibility and oversight, and lack of accountability. What are our processes to mitigate risk? Who are the people responsible for executing and enforcing those controls? Okay, next please. Oh, okay. This is my favorite slide. Typically done in person. Um, definitely maybe a little bit more effective, at least uh, for me being a speaker and having a, a group participating in a room with us on a, on a chant like this. Um, but it is a slide that we do like to still include, although slightly awkward. Um, I, I'm going to ask that all of you from your kitchen table this morning, you, you participate with me uh, in spirit while I go ahead and, and, and chant this out for us today. Um, email notification is not sufficient to send a wire, ACH, or change supplier information. I'll say it again. Email notification is not email sufficient to send the wire, ACH, or change supplier information. Or change supplier information. <laughs> you got it. I, I, I felt that. Thank you. I felt some participation there. I appreciate it. Um, you know, even, even with my, my commentary and, and trying to, to poke some fun at the, this group chant, um, I, really, I really do feel like the message is very, very important here. Um, and this is something that you're going to hear us talk about uh, now throughout the presentation as far as ensuring that those uh, payment instructions are not changed until a phone call is made to your vendor supplier to verify information. And don't call a phone number that's been provided in an email notification of updated payment instructions uh, or even an address change. Someone can try, can try to intercept live checks um, even at a fraudulent address. So, you know, always use the phone number that you have for your uh, supplier vendor on the system and your contact there and pick up the phone and reach out to them. Okay. So on the next slide here, we've got some great internal best practices that organizations of all sizes are reporting that they have implemented. And I'm gonna point out a couple on this slide um, one that I'd like to first highlight, 61% of organizations now have controls in place to prohibit payment initiation based on emails. So it goes back to my awkward chant, right? Um, how can we enforce something like this, do you ask? Well, we're certainly going to talk about that in a minute, and the bank does have technology to help you enforce that within your organization. Um, the other best practice that I would like to point out, 17%, uh, which hopefully will be on the rise for next year's AFP report, we've got 17% of organizations reporting that they now have an email rule that automatically flags emails where the reply email is different from the from email. And I like this because in situations of a BEC scam, 
the, the email addresses that the perpetrators used are so similar, they could be off by one letter or an addition of, of one digit. And it's not something that we would typically notice. Um, however, if you implement the technology to catch those inconsistencies, that will flag that email as a potential risk. Um, so that's definitely a good practice that I hope to see move up on the chart um, for 2020's report. And so Ezra, I know that uh, you're our internal control guru. Is there a particular best practice that you wanted to point out today? Yeah, yeah, to me, it's the first one. And there's been, been some articles written on it, but end user education. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're all representatives of our companies as we're, you know, your company's clicking on email links right now. And you can't underestimate, it just takes one click to open up that window into your company system. You can't underestimate how much you need to continuously educate your employees on that they can't, that they have to be skeptical, they can't click on the links, uh, and they have to use the steps to identify uh, what can be fraudulent and what steps they should take. Uh, the, the silly posters in the office, the recurring weekly emails, incredibly valued. So when trust does testing all the time, um, not the last test I passed, one before that test, one before that I failed. And I did it for my phone. It said I had a UPS package and on my phone, my emails, I couldn't tell whether it was a business or personal email and I knew a UPS package was coming and I clicked on email and I said, oh, damn it. And, you know, I, I said in the Browns fan loyalist, I got a big guilty streak and man, I felt really guilty. And I called my boss. I called Tom, Tom, I feel so bad. I clicked on it. I thought I was getting fired. Turns out I wasn't getting fired. And the procedure is not to fire you on one offense. I think your third offense, you get fired. You get written up on your second one. Um, but you have to be really, really serious about it and, and get on your employees. There's an article written about, should you scare your employees? Um, and if anybody's interested, I can send out a link later about that. Um, you know, I, originally I was in favor of scaring people. I was scared and it motivated me for not clicking on links again, because I thought I was gonna get fired. But that scaring can, can really then paralyze them from doing their job and lowering the self-esteem and love all those kinds of things. So you, I think you get right up to the point for scaring them. You, you can't do too much on this. You just have to keep communicating. You can't open the link. The thieves are out there. We saw 46% of unemployment fraud. The information's all out there. The diligence and the repetition is really, really important. So Michelle, to me, that's the one. That... All right, great. Thank you. Okay, so internal best practices. Fraud checks up, checkups, insurance coverage, dual control at the administrative level, external uh, electronic transactions. So at the payment level, dual control, reconciliation, signer considerations. This is all a great checklist for you to review with your bank on an annual basis, your accountant, your insurance agent, and review those fraud protection tools. Ask about the new technology. Uh, review your cyber insurance with your insurance agent. Uh, review the coverage and what that all entails. Internal control, separation of duties, review account authority and signers. All of these things should be reviewed at a minimum annually. And chances are you'll have updates to those, um, to those concerns with new technology that banks are constantly um, evolving to change to keep ahead of the um, the fraudsters and uh, the perpetrators that keep um, uh, ad adjusting to to our our technology and our environment unfortunately okay so next slide is tech best practices accessing information from a dedicated computer so more and more, I do hear that especially title companies do have a segregated PC in their office that they're dedicated um, to accessing uh, financial information only. Um, so email is restricted. They don't browse to websites outside of financial platforms. And that is a dedicated PC for that purpose. Um, do not make payment decisions based on mobile versions of an email. 
uh, do not click on um, UPS tracking links, apparently, um, based on a mobile version of an email, um, especially if you, you may or may not be expecting a package, as we just learned. Um, so those mobile versions of email, even though we're all um, becoming more and more proficient at, um, at managing our email on our mobile devices, it, it can create challenges. And sometimes it's not it's not easy to follow the chain of responses at all times. Um, and it's sometimes it's also not as, as easy to identify that sender email address and notice any inconsistency you know, that we talked about earlier that could potentially be um, a BEC scam. So um, get back to your PC or um, pick up uh, the phone and make a phone call when any payment decision is involved um, and you're receiving that request on your mobile device. Okay, a layered security for financial transactions, again, goes back to separation of duties, internal control. Um, Ezra, I think we need to put those two buzzwords on our uh, drinking game. Um, I, I don't know <laughs> that I would have made it through the presentation if I was actually participating at this point, but um, I can't say it enough. Um, separation of duties and internal control, you'll hear us at the bank advocate for that. Um, all the time uh, when it comes to your online platform and security surrounding that. Um, so do not use public Wi-Fi to access personal or business account information. Um, hopefully we all are, are well aware of the risk there at this point. Um, work with your IT professional to actively maintain your firewall, um, antivirus software, make sure your patches are all up to date, back up your data. Um, that's so, so important as everything is constantly changing and evolving and fraudsters get more sophisticated. Um, we have to keep consistently updating and adjusting our security um, protocols. So work with your IT professional on that. And then phishing checkups to scare, not to scare. Ezra touched on that. And, you know, I, I can't disagree. And, and we, we do um, have that, implement that educational tool at Wintrust. And and I, I can say I have been a victim of that once too, since Ezra has, has shared that information and he's, he's my boss. So I, and I, I, I was uh, upfront about it just as he was and, and reached out to my boss when this happened a couple of years ago. And I was uh, pretty nervous. Um, and it was actually the exact same um, social engineering um, email for UPS and yeah, this is what so many packages coming now, you just don't know and, and always, always be cautious when you're clicking on that tracking information. So I, I feel a little bit better, Ezra. Thank you for sharing that story first, uh, and then, which allowed me to share the story. And since it's the same one, I feel a little bit better about that. So, and it was a few years ago. Now no I'm problem, so I don't click on anything. Okay. <laughs> Won't do it anymore. Exactly, exactly. But, but that's how you learn. Lesson learned. <laughs> okay. Um, other best practices. Next slide, please. Uh, mail processes, internal and external. Not something that we think about every day, but your, your mail. How is incoming mail being sorted? How is it be being distri distributed within the organization? Who's opening the mail? Who's opening bank statements? Who's doing the bank recs? Is there a separation of duties there? Account segregation, a special purposes account is another great tool. Have a separate payroll account from your main operating account. Um, what I've seen come back in recent years as well is a segregated EFT account, electronic funds transfer account, as people look to segregate their uh, ACH debit and credit activity to one dedicated account. Um, so that's something that, uh, that we're seeing increased requests for as well. Account reconciliation every morning reports suspicious items immediately. You know, if you take away a handful of things from this presentation, you know, my awkward chant uh, should definitely be one um, and always pick up the phone to confirm those payment instructions. But this, this should be number two. And I, I really want to, to highlight the need to reconcile your account each morning. And what I mean by that is we do our check processing and posting uh, overnight. So every morning you will wake up and you will be able to log in online and you'll see the prior day activity. And then you will see current day in real time ACH activity pending. 
that reconciliation of those items needs to take place that morning to ensure accuracy on all of those debits. And so that actually does include reviewing those checks front and back to ensure that the payee name, the dollar amount, the endorsement, and everything looks as it should on those checks. And Michelle, there is can a I way- for a second on the, on the reconciliation? Absolutely. There, there was a story in the news, it's been, I don't know, it was a week, two weeks ago. If you were a banker, you read the story one way, and if you were um, um, a non-banker, you read this, you followed the story another. It was on one of the local news channels. And it was about the poor guy who lost all his money to a thief um, from, from stealing from his account. And, um, and he looked at his bank account one day, he thought he had a bunch of money and the bank account had overdrafts. And he said, well, you know, poor bank, I was being stolen from the bank didn't tell me. Well, what had happened over a course of like six or nine months, the thief who had his account information had been slowly draining the account. Um, he never reconciled his account uh, and he didn't know about it until eventually the thief just said, I'm just going to take it down to zero now. If he was reconcil reconciling, would have been caught right away. The story was framed as, a, you know, bank should give him his money back or things like that. But it was over months and months and months and he just never reconciled his account. And it's a sad story and I feel bad for the guy. But there's like best practice to take care of, to prevent, to prevent. Yeah, get a little, don't get a lot, you know. Yep, absolutely, thank you, Ezra. Those real life uh, scenarios really do help to, to put some color onto this. And it's, it's really not just us preaching uh, these practices, but um, it, it, does, it does take conversations like this and, and webinars and, and reaching people on a broad scale um, to really implement changes and, and, and enforce the importance of this. So uh, we, we cannot uh, say it enough. Um, so thank you. Okay, and then on the next slide, please, bank services. Um, so, so this goes back to the previous slide and uh, what Ezra had mentioned, reconciling your account daily. Um, how can we help lessen that load for you and automate some of those cumbersome processes? We hear from businesses all the time that they don't have the capacity to log into their online platform every morning and look at each check front and back. They're running their business. So they are looking for ways to automate that process for them, for the bank to give them the tools to run their business and monitor their account in an automated fashion. And check positive pay with payee name verification is our best tool to achieve that. So with check positive pay, this is an industry standard term. So accountants are talking about it, insurance agents are talking about it, software ERP providers are talking about this, banks are talking about it. Um, uh, beating a, a, a dead horse with it at this point, but so, so important. Uh, what this uh, does, you would upload a file to the bank that contains your check issue file. So four pieces of criteria from your checks that you issue, the date, the check number, the dollar amount, and the payee name of each check that you authorize at your office. And then from there, it's an automated match against your file. So you're uploading that file through our platform. We're automating that reconciliation process for you. And we are validating that that check that posts to your account matches against the criteria that you provided to us in your check issue file. Um, so it is your best protection against check fraud, which again, from our statistical slides, you know that 74% of fraud takes place still in the form of paper check. Unfortunately, all too easy for a perpetrator to go into a Costco and buy check stock and then perpetrate fraud. All they need is your account number and routing number to do that. Okay, um, so ACH debit block, um, that is your um, protection against unauthorized ACH debits. So I like to think of it as a debit filter. You approve companies that you have previously given authorization for to debit your account. So think of your payroll providers, your ADP, 
your taxes, you know, Illinois Department of Revenue uh, and so on. So you wanna pre-authorize those to pay automatically and only filter out the debits that you want to review monthly. So if you have utility payments, at this point, I would suggest always reviewing your utility payments because things can slip through. We do see situations where we have clients who have authorized, for example, Comcast or ComEd or NICOR Gas to automatically debit their account for their utility bills. Of course, you know, that's, the, that's an authorized payment. However, then they'll reconcile their accounts at the end of the month and they see that there's been five payments to Comcast that month or five payments to AT&T. So it's, it, 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 for the utility payments, it's not even something um, that we recommend adding to that automated approval at this point, since there's so much fraud going on um, within these companies and people trying to, to pay their bills, unfortunately. Um, so tokens and UBA, UBA stands for out of band authentication. So this is the text code to your mobile phone. Um, if any of you um, have external money movement already on an online banking platform with Wintrust, you are familiar with tokens or the traditional handheld key fob or soft token app. Um, which is a, an app-based FOB, um, which is great. And you also might, uh, might be familiar with using FOBs and UBA in conjunction together on your profile for added layer of security. And it just depends on the security procedures that you have in place for your platform. Again, goes back to dual control and separation of duties, okay? Online alerts, they're free. Free online alerts. Um, there's probably hundreds of them online. So please, please take advantage of those alerts. Um, they're, they're there for you, for, uh, for, to help you. Um, they can be in the form of email or text alerts. So please look into that and, and take advantage of those free alerts. Um, they're certainly helpful. Um, dual administrators and dual control. Um, dual control, again, separate entry from approval at the payment level. Dual administrators, as we talk to our clients, we find more and more that no one person in an organization wants the sole responsibility to be the primary security administrator on the platform, meaning that they have all rights and all access to um, update user level authority, add, delete new sub users, and so on. They want oversight into that process. So more and more clients are very receptive to having dual control and having that, um, that oversight at the security administrator level. And I'll, I'll take this a step further too. It's not on the slide, but we talked earlier about companies prohibiting the update of payment instructions based on email only. How are they enforcing that? Um, so one of the things that we can help is to offer dual control on template creation and edits. And what that does is it puts a pause on the process to update payment instructions. So for example, you have an AP clerk and they receive a payment instruction notification. Um, they're gonna input that into a template they're, or they're gonna create a new template, make changes and what have you. The bank is going to enforce dual control on that process. So there is an approval notification then that would go to an approver designated within the platform, that person can then review that all of the protocols were followed before that payment, the payment instructions were changed prior to approving that. Um, so that is one tool that we can actually um, provide to help our businesses enforce um, that dual control on updating payment instructions. Okay. And then the quarantined account, a post no check account. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about EFP or EFT accounts, um, ACH accounts for debit and credit activity. If you do have a segregated account or a quarantined account that would in no uh, instance receive any check payments to that account normally, and you wanted to go ahead and put a posting restriction on that account, this is for ACH only, it should not be receiving checks then we can place that restriction on the account um, to enforce that for you, for, again, from the bank side. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Ezra. I think I might've seen a poll question pop up on the screen. 
Thanks, Michelle. That was terrific. Appreciate that. Yeah, so now we're going to poll question number two. We're transitioning to the second part of the presentation, just about five uh, to uh, 10 minutes of the second part here. So kick it off with this poll question for all of you. Um, I'm going to write up here. Okay. In five years, will banking look more like, pick one, Amazon, Walmart, your doctor's office, Starbucks, Hilton, everybody, please click what you think the answer is. And we'll see what the poll results. Clearly, industries are changing a lot. There's a lot of talk of what banking will look like, what technology, will there be branches, uh, um, um, user experiences, and the like, and wondering what you guys think before we get into what uh, um, things about the future of banking um, will look like. And coming right up, here it is. Here's our results coming right at you. You're like the DJ talking up the song. Amazon, 65% Amazon, 4% Walmart, your doctor's office, 14% Starbucks, Hilton. Uh, Hilton was a red herring. I just got it through and threw in another name in there. Okay, so let's talk about Amazonification versus your doctor's office. Um, everybody talks about Amazon. Um, disruptor there, I said disruptor. Yeah, service, but your doctor's office, central service point utilizing the tools that are developed by others. Okay, so I wanna talk about the companies everybody uses as example, the big, the big disruptors. Okay, another drink, gosh, I'm getting you guys drunk this early in the morning. Um, uh, Airbnb, Amazon, and Uber. And it's interesting when you think about what these things have in common. Hey, uh, Jamie, Jamie, yourself, do you know how Amazon got it started? How did Amazon get started, Jamie? Yeah, I think selling textbooks. Can't hear you. Selling books, right. And why did people buy their books from Amazon? Uh, they were uh, no sales tax. Right, exactly. No sales tax on Amazon. And so it was cheaper. Airbnb, um, uh, no amusement tax. No um, Uber, federal regulations, state regulations, and restrictions of uh, um, taxi medallions, okay? So all these businesses got started by getting around federal or state regulations. Everybody's talking about them as these great disruptors and these great innovators, but their innovation really started by getting around regulation. Um, what, but what, Becky told, uh, uh, because of insurance. So since the government gives its insurance, then it has the right to really a broad regulatory impacts. And the second is because of cash and regulating who gets cash and, and money launders and, and thieves and things like that. Um, the, the online lending things getting around, so as we talk about future lending, lending club, funding circle, cabbage, all have been tremendous flops. It's collapsed on them um, and it's really this, this fly by night, um, 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 lean and mean banking so far has really not been successful. Um, Jamie and I, great minds think alike, because I had this slide and Jamie actually came up with a slide, not seeing mine, but very similar to this one. And that is real innovation has been slow. I think of it, you know, to me, the slowest innovation brought to you by your government is you go on a plane, they still have to tell you how to use your seatbelt. Um, but innovation in banking only happens at the federal level in event of a crime. And check 21 and, and digital things came out 9 11. COVID work from home, digital banking as a result. The SNL crisis and regulations that came out of that. The only responses have really been in crises and not in innovation um, in and of itself. So the question is where does, where does Bitcoin come in? And to quote, uh, anyone know? Uh, Michelle, you know where this quote comes from? Rat Poison Square? You're the only people I can see, so as I'm calling out. Any idea? You can say no. I don't know. Warren Buffett called Bitcoin rat poison squared. My son, though, my millennial son, pointed out to me that that was two years ago. So I'm going to differentiate Bitcoin as an investment versus Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, Bitcoin is invest as a, and in a way they're related. Bitcoin is a currency. Really, there's not much being spent on Bitcoin. Um, there was, oh, you can buy a pizza with Bitcoin. You can do a lot of it things with Bitcoin. 
in digital currency, but there is very little commerce actually happening. Happening. If um, um, commerce actually increased, a major thing is for illegal transactions. So if it ever really became more um, um, readily accepted and utilized, it's my belief the federal government will shut it down. The, we are regulated as how much cash we can receive, how much someone can deposit, all those systems to so that the, we are the eyes of the government to track criminals and tax evasion. And what happens if all that goes to Bitcoin and it can't be tracked? The government's going to shut it down. Now, Bitcoin is an investment then is is a, a vehicle without any innate need behind it. And supply and demand of investing is moving up and down the supply. It's not based on oh, more people are demanding it, more people are using it. It's, it's just a hedge, a holding place uh, um, for inflation and for other things. And, and that, that's my belief of, of uh, what's going on today with Bitcoin. Um, okay, so I really believe that the future of banking is gonna look a lot more like your doctor's office. Um, and how to center your uh, but that doctor buys a lot of goods and services from a lot of other places. They'll send you to the hospital. They don't own the hospital. They get medications. They have nothing to do with the medications. Um, um, diagnostic tools, physical therapy, all those types of things. The doctor is in the center of that model. But those tools themselves come from a variety of different places. And that is where banking is evolving to. Um, it's much further advanced on this in Europe. Um, but, but, you know, we may white label a lot of products. The online banking module can come from a separate fintech. Time payments comes from a separate company that, that created that. The integrated payables, we'll talk about it in a second, comes from that. All these, the, the lockbox, the, the um, whole variety of services that the bank is the focus of how that gets delivered. Now, one of the reasons why that's is because of all the federal regulations, banks are forced to be a little bit slow to innovate. Um, when we, it's very difficult for us to sign a contract with a new vendor. We have to go through tremendous due diligence process on that. Um, and, and the pace of that is not the same pace as some of the FinTech innovators. Um, uh, the programmers wanna work on quickly in and out on projects, rapid innovation, um, um, uh, big development, and those people don't function as well in the banking environment and don't want a regulator looking over their shoulders to what they're doing. So that lends to this belief of the model that those types and those companies, those fintechs will be creating the products. The bank will choose the best of the breeds, white label those products, and then deliver those innovations to the customer. That, and we're the one that's regulated and they'll stay out of it. So why isn't that going to be Amazon? Because once the bank gets into um, uh, once the federal government gets into Amazon's business, look, they're into it now and, and, and Facebook and those other companies, Facebook announced a currency, shut that down fast, remember? Um, they cannot, they don't have the infrastructure to go along with those regulations and it's gonna affect other pieces of their business um, that also then get regulated as a result. And that's why it's my strong belief that this doctor's model is much more realistic of what the future of banking is gonna look like. Okay, so what else is, is coming? Um, a big bug, these partnering, the white labeling that we talked about, um, uh, the Venmofication, uh, where, where using an application, regardless of what bank that you're at that you're participating with. Jamie's gonna talk about integrated payables, but integrated receivables, uh, a hub where, where your, all your payments come in and collecting that information. Real-time payments, there's been some innovations with that coming out. Um, to make those payments same day, but that's getting expanded significantly and third parties are also getting involved to help the banks out with those transactions. Um, cards, uh, there's a lot of pressure to get more and more payment onto cards. Virtual cards, controlled transaction, and, uh, put payments right into people's hands with restrictions and their ability to do that. And lastly, there's a tremendous amount of innovation coming on identity verification. Um, I go to a lot of trade shows in banking and the future of banking uh, and speak on the topic and, and who is your customer and what is their identification, housing that in individual secured hubs, uh, um, being able to get that information quickly to the bank when opening up new accounts to expedite the due diligence process. There's a lot of money being invested in that front. 
Um, okay, I'm now ready to turn it over to Jamie. Before I do, I wanna just remind everybody, and I've seen already that there is a lot of questions coming in on the chat. We go through those, the presentation, if anything, All right, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Voss and a Vice President here at Wind Trust. Um, I focus on treasury sales and integrated uh, payables. I'm also an AAP. And then I also sit on the Board of Directors for um, Payment Advisory Resource, which is PAR, which is really the um, for-profit arm of the Mid-Atlantic uh, ACH Association. I've been here at Wind Trust for six years. And something interesting personally about me is uh, I am an avid show skier. So um, for any of those that um, have seen a Tommy Bartlett show, um, sadly, uh, they've gone out of business now, but our, our Cypress Gardens water ski show, um, that's what I do. And I'm actually uh, through that a five time uh, Guinness world record holder. So just something kind of interesting about me personally. So we're going to go into the next slide, uh, which is which is going to start us off as a, as a poll question. Um, and it's about AP automation. Just waiting for that to pop up. All right. So AP automation, uh, you use it now. You are looking into it. Uh, you're not interested or you have no idea what I'm talking about. So go ahead and select one of those. I think something interesting about this poll question too is that um, it, it'd also be interesting to know um, if you've heard of this pre-COVID as well. So just give you a few seconds here to submit your answer. Hey, Jamie, what's one of the records you oh, uh, forget it? Never mind. Vamping done. <laughs> okay. All right. So 50%, kind of what I expected. Uh, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and 35%, that is really promising that you're looking into that. And I think that um, certainly uh, COVID has been a big driver in that, um, in that AP automation. So um, as we go to the next slide, just want to talk a little bit here about kind of the, the state of payables automation. So we've done a really good job over the years of moving payroll uh, to more of an automated process, right? So um, no longer a, a lot of businesses are handling that in-house. They've outsourced that, whether it's to the C CPA or whether it's to um, some software that they're getting. So um, again, just makes that a lot easier process in the fact that you get direct deposit. Um, and that uh, withholding and all of that is kind of best left up to the professionals. Employee expenses, uh, that one's certainly starting to come down um, from a manual process to more of an automated process. Uh, you're seeing a lot of um, apps and software now uh, that have really automated this and that, uh, you know, we use one here at Wintrust where um, if I am out to lunch and I get the receipt, I just use my smartphone and I take a picture of that and it goes right into the app and boom, I'm done. Um, so again, easy tracking on the employees uh, side of things, as well as being able to capture those approvals um, automatically as well. Tax management, uh, I don't think there's been a lot of movement there. Uh, again, you know, that one's difficult in the fact that um, it's very uh, customized to, to each business, right? And then you've got accounts payable. 93% of that is a manual process. So that's really what we wanna focus on today um, and talk about and, and how um, you know, to move that to more of an automated process and get away from that manual process. All right, so uh, next slide. 
as Ezra had touched on, uh, you know, taking a look back at history, right, and, and what are um, driving forces for change. And uh, a lot of that uh, is, 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 you know, different disruptions that we have. Um, so the Great Depression, uh, the, uh, you know, subprime mortgage uh, issue that we had back in 2008, the bank panic of 1907. And then certainly, I think, um, from a technology standpoint, that has been very impactful for us is 9-11. Is I think with those, with those other ones, um, that brings about a lot of banking regulation, where with 9-11, we found that um, when our planes were grounded for three plus days, uh, we had billions of dollars of checks sitting on runways and planes because that's how we moved, um, that's how we moved our physical checks, right? Um, so that really brought about a, a big change with checks, check 21 and, uh, and being able to um, give the okay for electronic images of, of checks and leading to truncation. And I think too there, you know, it, it also gave rise to remote deposit capture, right? Because now you've got those electronic images um, of those checks. Banks first started to use it themselves and now are, you know, offer it to clients. Uh, on the next slide, as I said, um, you know, again, I think 9-11 was a big catalyst for us for change um, on, on the technology standpoint. And I think coronavirus, COVID-19, I think is going to be another one of those. Um, I think that, you know, innovation doesn't come from regulation. I think it comes from, uh, you know, the, the market forces doing what they do um, to be able to deliver and create products and services uh, that are gonna help everyday folks, um, especially on the business side of things. Uh, I think COVID-19 has really, um, it, it, it's really permanently transformed the way as a society we're going to function. Um, you know, certainly in the short term here, we're, we're dealing with some things, but I think it will have some lasting impact on us going forward. Um, so again, that forced us also to look at the fact that we've got a very manual process uh, when it comes to our, our AP processing. And so really, it's broken in a way um, because we've got such a manual process with that. So when you're looking at, uh, at invoices, those invoices can be coming in a variety of different ways, right? And, and a lot of them are paper. So whether they're coming in through the mail, whether you've got uh, vendors that are coming in and actually physically handing them to you, um, or if you're getting them to email or, or, or different emails to different employees, right? Um, then you've got the invoice, invoice approval. So now you're shuffling around this paper to get people's approval or get emails for their approval. And now you've got to staple that to your stack of papers so that you've got an audit trail. And again, that's a really inefficient and, and manual process. And then the payment authorization. So again, as, as uh, you know, Michelle and Ezra had both highlighted that we really want to focus on those internal controls. And when we've got a manual process like that, it really leads to weak and really inconsistent uh, financial controls. And then certainly too, when it comes to sending the payment, uh, most of those payments is, uh, as, um, Michelle had shown in, in one of her previous slides are still going out paper. All right, so next, next slide. So this is, this is interesting and I wish I would have had this photo, but um, two years ago I had a client um, that I was talking to about uh, moving to AP automation and the solution that we have with invoice. And um, I could not find the exact picture, but it's, but it's interesting. He sent me a picture um, of, of their, their, their weekly um, invoice or uh, payments that were going out, right? And it was, it was really impactful because he said, here I've got a college-educated finance major that is literally stuffing checks into envelopes licking them close, putting stamps on them, and I'm sending them to the post office. And so I think that that just really highlight, highlights, uh, you know, again, such a manual process and really we can take that um, and integrate that 
so that you're making that a more automated process. And again, too, we've got really highly skilled people um, that we're doing for just very manual um, tasks, and we can have them, we can put their, their um, skills to, to, to better use, okay? All right. So next slide. All right, so AP automation makes things much simpler and safer. So it really starts with your uh, accounting or ERP system. And what's, uh, what's great about this is we integrate with that accounting or ERP system. And so what we're doing is, is Winvoice, which is our AP automation solution, is really looking, um, if there's, a, there's kind of a, a two-way sync that's going back and forth between the two. And it allows you to capture the invoices. Um, it captures those invoices, both the header and line level information. You do that by giving your vendors an email address and, um, and then sending that. And then uh, if you happen to get any uh, physical uh, mail in the office, you can just scan those in. We electronically capture all of that information. And then from there, everything is electronic in that the approval process is going to be electronic. So whether you're just a, a you know, one or two man shop in, in, your, in your AP department, um, or you've got multiple department heads and, you, and you've got multiple layers in there, um, those approvals can be based on what works best for you. Then it comes to the payment authorization. So now we're looking, again, another layer of approval is that somebody is going to go in and authorize that payment. And in, during that function, again, they can review uh, electronically the invoice that has come in. They can see how that payment is being made. They can see if you're taking advantage of any early pay discounts. And then again, they're sending out that payment and something nice about that is once the payment is sent, uh, your vendors then get an automated uh, email remittance that lets them know what invoices are associated with that payment that they're going to be receiving. And then again, this is where the integration comes in and the fact that this is all going to reconcile back to your accounting or ERP system. And then there are different ways that you can make those payments. Uh, you can make them check uh, ACH or card. So on our next slide, with WinVoice, we just make AP automation simpler, more efficient, safer, because we've got those controls in place um, with the different layers of uh, approvals. And it really can pay you back in the fact that, again, now you're not spending so much time processing your AP. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit, again, we're, we're talking about in terms of COVID, right? So um, things really changed for us back in March in that um, all of a sudden employees may not be coming into the office anymore, right? Um, or if we've got COVID exposure, now somebody's got a quarantine at home for a couple of weeks. So that has really hindered uh, that manual AP process, which is why we think that um, this, this automated process is, is really the way to go for you. So um, again, when it comes back to the, uh, the invoice receipts, uh, remote workers, they don't have to worry about handling paper because those invoices have already been captured electronically. So again, we're reducing any traveling to the office to, to pick up um, any, uh, any paper invoices and shuffle those around. The invoice capture and coding, again, because this syncs with your uh, accounting or ERP system, we're actually coding that for you based off of, um, you know, what's in your ERP or accounting system. And then invoice approval. Um, so there again, if you've got multiple layers, so maybe you're using department heads, uh, they can approve those invoices uh, and then uh, they can approve them anytime and it just doesn't matter where they're located, right? So on the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, payment authorization. 
And again, so payment approvers can easily review and approve these payments at any time, and it, it just it doesn't matter where they're located. And then the execution, you don't need to be in your office to send out payments. You don't have to physically sign a check any longer. And the other thing that's really great about this is it, you know, AP Automation offers you a flexible, uh, streamlined workflow versus really uh, when we talk about the manual process, it's very tedious, costly, and it's error prone, right? Because you've got you've got people um, that are are in the middle of that um, moving things around. Another great feature about AP Automation too is it really creates a great audit trail for you. So again, you're capturing um, all of those invoices electronically and they're stored electronically, as well as you're capturing the invoice approvals electronically, the payment approval electronically. So for those of you that have uh, yearly audits and um, you have to pull those things up, they're really you know, right, at, right at your fingertips. And then also too with AP Automation, that really gives you a search, search and uh, reporting capabilities. Again, you can search on um, you know, invoice numbers, vendors, uh, date ranges, and then um, payment amounts. And again, really important. So on our next slide, we're going to talk about, I'm just going to reiterate a little bit of what we've been talking about here in, with fraud um, and then attempted fraud and, and actual payment fraud. And again, I think this will be interesting in 12 months to see how much these have, have changed and shifted. Um, and so really, when you look at it, you know, checks is still a lot of fraud with checks. But when you look down below um, at the bottom there with ACH debits, ACH credits, and virtual cards, uh, those have a lot less instances of fraud, which is, um, again, with Winvoice, we offer that ability to make payments uh, through ACH and through virtual card. And then I believe on our last slide here, we're just going to talk a little bit about um, making AP safer. All right. So again, just kind of reiterating what um, Michelle and Ezra had both talked about that, you know, realize that no one solution offers 100% protection. And really, when it comes to protecting your accounts and protecting your information, a layered approach is really going to give you the best protection. So make sure you're enforcing controls on invoice capture and approval. So this really with Winvoice, it eliminates uh, fake invoices from vendors. And again, allows you to have those uh, invoice approval tiers. And then enforce invoice posting to your ERP prior to payment. Again, this offers controls to make sure that the invoices that are posted are actually known vendors in your ERP or accounting software. Make sure you're enforcing strict segregation of duties during payment approval. Again, I know that we've talked about this with a couple of slides, but um, again, very important. Enforce two-factor authentication. Again, log in, and then when you're releasing those payments, make sure you've got one person that's initiating and another person that's approving. And then make sure you're enforcing limits and controls for all your payments, and that's really going to help limit any potential losses. Posit another great thing about AP Automation and our Winvoice solution is it also offers positive pay integration with the bank. So those payments that you're making via check, uh, we actually create that um, positive pay file for you. We upload it. Um, and then again, we're just making sure as those checks clear the bank uh, that they are true to, um, to what you uh, made for payments. And then again, virtual cards too. So that's another way that you can make a payment using Winvoice. And what's great about that is it complements your, your corporate card program, but it doesn't have you, you know, sending out an actual physical card inf information. You're getting a single use token. It's for the exact amount. It's for that vendor. And there's an expiration date. All right. So again, thanks for the thanks for your time and listening to um, AP uh, Automation. And at this point, I am going to toss it back to Ezra. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie. First of all, I want to thank. Uh, 
was behind. Answering all questions along, I, of course, multitasking, texting with Tammy. And she told me that a lot of questions have come up. She's been answering them. A couple have not been answered. First of all, I know we've run over. So I appreciate everybody who stayed on and we'll stay on for another 10 minutes if you'd like to answer some of these questions here on a couple of sent in advance. So one question that came up with, okay, the unemployment fraud, how is the thief making any money? Actually, doing a, since both my wife and I are doing a lot of research on this and they do get the money, um, but a lot of it's being caught. That's the thing. In one sense, this is the process very well. What you do is send in a form and give them a social security number. Um, on the other sense, you need to, to get the money, you need to either redirect the, your someone's mailing address, which in the situation they attempted to do. And if a card is issued, called up and say the card is automatically. So the unemployment fraud is, is getting caught along the way, but it's still so lucrative that the thieves are still working on it. Um, so that answer. We have a couple on that were emailed in advance, but Tammy, is there any questions I've not looked at myself? Questions you want to bring up specifically to ask for the for the speakers? So we had a couple of questions about will this be available, the presentation be available. So we are recording this and we will be posting it to LinkedIn. But if you want a copy of the PDF, please contact your OneTrust account officer and we'll get you a copy of the PDF. That was a couple of questions. Um, we've also had a couple of questions about, um, and Jamie, about software and uh, how that works with a, an AP uh, system such as WinVoice. And so um, I believe the answer would be, we we'll just contact their account officer and we'll work with them and get them a list of those softwares. Yes. Okay. Um, there was a couple of questions about, you know, what what is the bank's responsibility on fraud, and um, and uh, as I answered the question, it you know it's each circumstance is different. Um, there's not a one size fits all to that question, and so that's an account. Can I answer that question a little bit? Well, I'm sorry. It to, there's depending on the situation, of course. I know you know this. The, who's liable for to, to reimburse the money? Who's out the money? Is it the bank? Is it the client? No matter what, the customer is always out the time. And and like a like a static uh, um, you know uh, uh, wrapping to a to a package that it never comes off of you. So once you're stuck with the fraud, you're going to keep getting hit. So even if you're not out the money, you're going to be spending the time. Um, continuously defending yourself, and so making the investments in the fraud protection tools is is super important. And then um, one last thing, I did want to mention that um, WinTrust has a really nice fraud. It's a three-page fraud checklist. You can contact your account officer, and uh, they can get you a copy of that. It's a nice tool to go through and just check off what types of uh, techniques and procedures and policies you have in place for fraud right now with your company. So give us a call and we'll make sure you get that. And um, Jamie's been lots of interest in WinVoice. So I have a feeling you're going to be doing quite a few demos coming in the next few weeks. There were a couple questions sent in advance. One was about um, um, we have numerous, had numerous customer checks payable to our company intercepted and fraudulently passed with the bank accessing assessing numerous services how do we incentivize our clients to pay by credit card or ach which is a great question um uh so a couple thoughts on that one track it so if you have someone at your office who you designate them uh get people to switch over to ach track the success of that person motivate that person they will come up with creative ideas Two, sometimes you could give a gift card or give something back to the vendor, to the customer on the other side, that clerk who switches over their payment method to ACH. So you can, while even not giving the company a discount, you could say a thank you for switching over and send a package of popcorn over to the office or something like that. Those little successes. You can offer a discount 
straight up a discount on it. And also remind the customer that they're using a credit card for payment. They can be accumulating rewards on the other side. So that's a big incentive. Tracking, number one thing, um, track all the way through, track your success, track who is moving over, acknowledge that success, that will get people to move over in the end. Um, there was a question, does Windows, Wintrust have a plan for integrating EFT payments? Yes, that's exactly where Winvoice comes in, what Jamie's talked about it. What's the best way to dispose of your views? Checkbooks, shred them. Where, what's a good way to shred them? Wintrust branches have regular shredding events. I don't know, they're once every couple months. So keep an eye open in the bank. They get the big truck that comes by and shred everything there. Um, had a question about, I'm interested in the steps that the banks go, banks go through to investigate caching of fraudulent checks, particularly when they're the ones who could be liable for the issuing the check. Super loaded question, so I'm gonna to have to narrow it down a little bit to answer it. So I can speak for Wintrust. We answer, we cash checks for non-customers only when it's drawn on a customer of ours. And we have a limit of only cashing up $1,000 and we require ID for that. And we actually charge a fee for it too. Um, so given that there can be a tremendous amount of liability, that's why we have the controls on that. Now, sometimes those, those are fraudulent checks. Uh, they used to always be Friday afternoon when a banker couldn't be called um, uh, to verify. And we frequently, something looks unusual, call the customer, is this okay to cash? Who is this person? Things like that. The way to stop that is positive pay because then the information on that check is gonna get compared. And a lot of times when that happens, the bank might be liable because it could be a signature that still matches a facsimile signature and someone has just recreated a fake check and the customer isn't necessarily liable for that. And that's why we pair that down to limited number of those that will do as a customer courtesy. Um, there was a detailed question about, and I'm gonna read it off, can the electronic reporting display place a 24 hour date and timestamp on items so you can better monitor activity, cutoff activity. Uh, so that is something that in, in, uh, with enough volume, we can write up a protocol for that and develop a system about that with some time stamping that can be placed on that. Um, and it's, so if you want to um, uh, explore that further, uh, please um, reach out to, to me on that. Tammy, anything else interesting coming in that you want to go over? No, um, a couple of people wanted to know what Jamie's uh, Guinness records were. <laughs> um, all right, well, two of them were uh, world record uh, human pyramids. And um, another one was for trios. Uh, another one was for doubles. And another one was for ballet line. Hey. All on waters. All on waters. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, I think that's that's it, Ezra. I think. Um, but please contact your account officer. We'll get you with your treasury management person, and we'll make sure you know no, more about fraud and how to prevent it. Great. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Luke. Great. Thank you, Ezra. It sure is hard to follow a Guinness uh, world record holder, but uh, I'll do my best here in, in wanting to, to thank Ezra, Michelle, and Jamie for really this great conversation on, on a very important topic. You know, listening to your talks uh, reminds me of something I say to my uh, twin four-year-old boys on a near daily basis, which is, it is better to be safe than sorry. Now, usually I'm talking about jumping off furniture, you're talking about financial fraud, but I think that same message holds true. And it was an important one today, along with the fact that, you know, clearly there's a lot of great tools at, at companies' disposals and a lot of change that's coming in the banking industry. So, so thank you again to all of our speakers for really giving us the inside scoop on what businesses need to know today. And then in closing, I want to thank uh, everyone in the audience who tuned in to today's virtual event. Uh, we're going to be sending out a post-event survey, which we'd love for you to fill out so we can learn more about how Wintrust can best support you in the future. And then finally, uh, please save the date of Wednesday, February 17th for the next event in this series. The theme will be keeping your business covered and we hope you're able to tune in. So with that, uh, stay well and we look forward to seeing you all again soon.